Good morning. My name is Ellen Forsyth. I work at the State Library of New South Wales in Public Library Services. Gujari Mulina Wawul. This is Good Morning in Durak. And it's important that we hear this in local language. So do you want to try this with me? Gujari Mulina Wawul. Mulina Wawul. So now you can say Good Morning in Durak, which is the local language. Now this is a small enough start, but it is a start. I learned this from a Darug woman, Auntie Jacinta Tobin, and a Gadigal man, Joel Davidson, earlier this year. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and to any Indigenous people here today. As well, we acknowledge the contribution that people of many nations have made to this country. Key information today. If you are required to evacuate this room for any reason, please wait until directed by State Library staff. Do not go hearing off. And if you are directed to evacuate, our meeting place is the domain, which is the green park behind me here. So don't go somewhere else either. We need to account for you. Toilets are in the corridor over there. and. Please tweet today or share on Facebook or, I don't know, Instagram even, using the hashtag RA2018. You'll notice that there are a few other people using RA2018, but we were using this tag first. So we're going to stick with it. Um, I'll now hand over to uh, Becky Spratford, um, who will be really looking at the basics of Reader's Advisory and how to suggest reading for clients. Thank you so much, Becky. You're welcome. I am starting to share. Can we make sure it's sharing? Yep, I'll stand here while you're sharing. I did that. It didn't work. Hmm. Yes, it, yes, it was seeing oh, the blog. Okay, it yeah. did. Now, I'm just going okay, to turn the, the camera around so you can see the audience. Hi, audience. Can you see I can. But you know what? I cannot see Ellen is the chat. So if you can let me know if there are questions. Okay, sure I, how will, I can see that. Okay, I will be able to tell if chat comes up here and then everyone in the room will see if chat comes up here too. Great, and then just interrupt me because I'm totally fine with that. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to give myself a quick introduction. I told Ellen I would do this myself. My name is Becky Spratford. I think I appeared, I think it was three years ago at this same event, and I was talking about um, horror books specifically then. And Ellen invited me back to talk about General Reader's Advisory. So a little bit about me. Um, I am now a Reader's Advisory consultant. I train people everywhere to match books with readers, but through the public library. I specialize in helping readers ages 13 and up. Although, as you're going to see today, we're going to turn you into the readers. So um, it doesn't matter where you work and what age level of people you work with, because this training works for all age levels. Um, I did start in um, July of 2000 at the Berwyn Public Library, which is just outside Chicago. We touch Chicago in many parts. It's a town of about 60,000 people, um, mostly I would say the largest minority group is Spanish speaking, so we did a lot of work with um, new citizens too. And I worked there for 15 years. I created and ran the Reader's Advisory Department. I also taught um, at Dominican University uh, the Reader's Advisory course. Dominican University is the largest library school for a master's degree um, in the Chicago area. And so I would teach that course with Joyce Serix. We would do, um, we would share the year. So there were three semesters. I know semester means half, but there were three. That always bothered me. Um, and uh, each of us would do one alone, and we'd always do one together. And then um, in the meantime, I've written a few books. And this is the second book you can see on the screen right there, The Reader's Advisory Guide to Horror, second edition. I am under contract to write content for novelists. So you might see my name pop up when you're doing things with Duncan. And I am the. Um, one of the main horror reviewers for Booklist, and um, I am a member of the Horror Writers Association. It just ran their Librarian's Day at StokerCon, and we did give a special award to an Australian, so that was very exciting, Greg Chapman. Um, he did not make it because we were in Providence, Rhode Island, all the way on the east coast of America. So that's a little bit about me. 
I talk about what we're going to do with you today. Everything we're doing today can be found on my blog, RA for All, under my 10 basic rules of reader's advisory. That page is always, always on every page right here. Um, this talk follows this. It changes over time. The rules don't change that often. The last time I changed some rules was actually just in January. It, I say changes quite a bit. So this is a very specific to you. Um, all right, so let's start talking about with a quote from Duncan, who I know is in the room there, and he knows I'm using this quote. Um, books are our brand, but books are not our business. Reading is our business. This is why I'm here today. This is why we do Reader's Advisory. Books are what people associate with the library. Um, I now, I, Duncan said this for years. I used this quote even since then. That was in 2015. But a Pew report um, for the Center for Internet and Life came out that proves this, that when you ask people on the street, what do you think of when you think of the library? They say books. Ask the gentleman who who only comes to the library to get on Facebook and play games every single day, all day. What do you think of when you think of the library? That man says books. When you ask somebody who only checks out videos, what do they think of when they think of the library? They say books. Nine times out of ten, they say books. It is important to remember this. Books are what people associate with us. But what we really do and what we really work in, our business is reading. Whether it's reading books, whether it's reading by watching a movie, or listening to an audiobook, or looking at a graphic novel, or borrowing a, um, a music, listening, streaming, whether it's also teaching digital literacy, all of this is reading. This is what we do. Also, all of us have an origin story of why we work in the library that probably goes back, I, and I have yet to have found someone that this is not the case for, but there's always an exception. But that we go back to your origin story of why you do library work, why you are in a library. It has something to do with a book that caught your attention, an experience in the library when you were younger. But almost always there's a favorite book. And that is how the way I teach Reader's Advisory has changed over the years. When I was taught how to match readers with books and all of this, it was about the matching. You like this, I'm going to find you this. You like this, I have to not worry about what I like. I have changed it over the years, and I know Duncan feels the same because we've stayed in touch to discuss this over time. It's not about that anymore. It's about the experience the reader has in the library. It's about the conversations that get started. The best reader's advisory has very little to do with matching an exact book to the reader. The very best reader's advisory has to do with having conversations about books and reading. And that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to pray off the fact that I know that all of you have a book that sparked it all, that started it all. And I'm going to use that to my advantage to get more out of you so that you can learn more. And then it's going to be to your advantage at the end. So it's a little manipulation, but it's going to help you. Um, and what we're going to do right now is start. I don't know if Ellen gave you a sheet with terms, of with appeal terms. And if she didn't, it's no big deal because I'm going to put it up on the screen later. I got it. Somewhere. If you, oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm always prepared in case they don't, you don't. So on the top of that sheet, that sheet's from Joyce Sarix's book, um, Reader's Advisory Service in the Public Library. At the top of that sheet. Every single one of you, I want you to write down a book. It would be great if it was teen or up as level, but a book that you like, a book that you have enjoyed, whether you enjoyed it recently or whether it's a book that's an all-time favorite. Something that when I say to you, a book you like, the first thing that popped into your head. So please write it down on the top of that piece of paper. We're going to use that paper for an exercise in a little bit, and you're going to have to do something with that exercise. So if you don't write it down, you're going to be in trouble. Um, but the other thing I want to say while you're doing this is, and I get this question all the time from people, you are not going to be held forever that that is your favorite book. So that if the person next to you sees it and you one day tell them that that's, you know, you say a different book is your favorite, they're going to be like, no, you said this. That's not the point of this because library workers have a hard time with this. When I say write down a book you love, they struggle getting one. It just needs to be a book that you remember vividly that you very much enjoyed. Again, it would help like your favorite book from last year is a really good choice. 
Okay, so that's where we're going to start, and that's the place where we're beginning all of this. I want everyone to think about themselves and what they love to read and why the whole time I'm talking. Do not worry about the next step of matching books with readers. We're worrying about you and your love, which leads me right away. We're going to follow these 10 rules, and I'm going to blow them up a little bit more. I think. There we go. Um, and the first rule isn't mine. It's Betty Rosenberg's, and it's never apologize for your reading tastes. Um, this is all about being non-judgmental. In that book I talked about um, that you're – handout is from the Reader's Advisory Guide, uh, Reader's Advisory Service in the Public Library. Joyce Sarek's defines Reader's Advisory as being a service for leisure readers that is non-judgmental and that the staff who does it are knowledgeable. And those are the main things she talks about. And this non-judgmental is very, very important. If a patron comes to you and insists that they want to read the book that James Patterson won the Nobel Prize for, this happened to me. I am not making this up. You do not say to them, and this is what you want to say, you don't go, oh, honey, he is never going to win the Nobel Prize for anything. Um, nor do you say, the Nobel Prize is for a, you know, a body of work, not a specific book. We're not judging. We're not correcting. This person is asking a question and is trying to start a conversation about books. You do not need a better book. You need to figure out what they're asking for by talking to them. Now, this one took me 30 minutes or so, um, and I did have trouble figuring out exactly what she wanted. But after we had a long conversation about what she was looking to read, it turned out she wanted a book that James Patterson won a prize for. And it turns out that for his very first book, the Thomas Berryman number. James Patterson won the Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America for Best First Novel. So there, without judging her, I found her the book she wanted. Um, and that just is an example of not being judgmental. We don't want to find people better books. We want to have conversations with them about the books they want to read. Um, this page, there is a great link there, the non-judgmental list of what you should read. I'm not going to waste time connecting to it, but it's an article from the online literary magazine, The Millions, and it's a great list of things that, like, you know, this list, this required reading list of things that shouldn't be required. And it's really fun, and it will greatly ground you. So, um, you know, right now I want to talk to you about how we maybe talk about books. I know I said I wasn't going to worry too much about you suggesting books with readers, but we're going to do it a tiny bit, because I know you're going to get into it more with Duncan later. Um, I keep talking about leisure reading. I said that. I said that that's how Joyce defines it. I want to just make sure we understand that when I say leisure reading, I mean anything that you check out at your library, no matter what the format is, that somebody, that that person checking it out wants to read for fun. They, it is their choice what they do for leisure reading. I used to joke that, you know, no one reads the old car repair manuals. I don't know if you guys have them there, but we had these things called Chilton's, which were these car repair manuals. We and have them. now they're online. Okay, good. So Chilton's, we used to have shelves and shelves full of Chilton's. And, um, you know, we, they went online, and we don't have the books anymore. And I found out that there was a guy who used to come in and read them for fun. Because I would always see him there, and I just thought he was like a guy that worked on his car a lot. But it turned out he had a lot of fun reading about cars, cars he'd never owned, cars he'd never had any plans of owning. So don't underestimate what people read for fun. Um, but how are we going to do a little bit of sort of having that Reader's Advisory conversation? Well, this leads right away to rules three and four. We must always remember, first of all, that – oh, I should go back to actually rule two, which I didn't say. We suggest we don't recommend. So when we do talk to people about books, and you're going to talk with Duncan about how to make those suggestions, a lot of times off of books you've never read. Um, but when we suggest, it puts much less pressure on them to take the book and like it. So if we're saying, you know, it sounds like you would really like this book based on what you're telling me or, you know, from using my resources or other readers or what I've heard from other people, this sounds like you might like it. I suggest you try it. Now, staff recommendation shelves are different. Those would be a recommendation. But when we talk about suggesting, it's much easier to say to someone, hey, you know what, give it a try. If you don't like it, close it up and bring it back. Here's a couple things I do to remind them that I'm there to help, not to force them to do anything. The first thing I say to them is, close it up, bring it back. Look at all these other books we have. There's, if you don't like this one, we'll find something you do like. 
Another one I like to say is, if you don't like it, I didn't write it. I don't care if you didn't like it. I'll find you one you do like. No hard feelings here. But the one that works the most I, is I say to you, don't back. Know if you've read it or not. A nervous laugh when I say that to people, but I swear they think we have some kind of librarian spidey sense that we know they finished the book. And when we take that pressure off, they're much more willing to give things a try, and they definitely like them more. So that is why we suggest and not recommend. When we recommend, it makes them feel like they have to struggle through it, and that is not what we want. It's all about making it a much more casual interaction between two people, or if there's more people involved, but you and the patron on what they like to read and what you like to read and how we can learn from each other. Which leads to three and four when we're matching books. Everyone reads a different version of the same book. This is a common rule that you hear a lot. This is not my unique rule. But we have to remember that. This is a little tricky because we're gonna, you have to be good at talking about books when you do reader's advisory. But you always have to be, you also have to be just as good at listening. And we're going to do a skill to, uh, exercise today where we do talk and listen. I cannot stress enough, everyone reads a different version of the same book. So when someone comes to us and tells us about a book they read, we have to listen to their version of it. In fact, if you've read the book, you need to listen even harder because it could be a completely different version of the same book. And I'm going to give some examples in a few moments that really get to the heart of this, real life examples where this happened. And when we listen to people, when we truly listen to people talk about books, you will notice that they are not talking about what happened in the book. They do not begin with a full rundown of the plot. In fact, rather, they talk about many more things like the adjectives about the book. Those adjectives we call appeal terms, and we're gonna, you're going to be spending the whole day talking about appeal terms. The ones you have in front of you are the appeal terms from Joyce's book. And there I have in rule four, write down adjectives about what you read, plot you can find. That link that says adjectives goes to the PDF of the novelist um, appeal terms, which I'm pretty sure Duncan's bringing you a flip chart of, because he brings them everywhere he goes. But um, you can get the PDF of it with that link also, for free. And what those adjectives do, and that's a more updated list. The list you have is older, but it's going to serve our purposes today. Because appeal gets to the part of why readers enjoy a specific book. Subject name equivalent of plot. And I'm going to do a really plot. Becky, you sound I'm flipping in and out a little bit at present. Could um, is, are you uh, okay, let's try. Okay, historical British. That's three subject headings. Historical British romances are three other subject headings. Normally, when I'm in the room, I ask for hands. I can't see them that well, but I'm gonna have you think about yourselves. If you like one, I bet most of you don't like the other. And I've done this, and I've seen that only maybe one hand stays up. But that's a sixty-seven percent match in a database. I will look at the book you wrote on the top of your paper right now. Look at that book title. Think about the plot for just a moment. <laughs> what happens in that book? Who goes on a quest? Where? What happens? You know, who dies? Who lives? Now, every book you love and li like, let's not even say love, every book you like, does it have that same plot? It doesn't. I'm, I'm positive. If someone does, put your hand up. If every book you like, because I did have a lady who only likes Tudor, um, in British Tudors, anything. And she'll read anything as long as it's in the Tudor period. Um, but the point is, if you think about all the books you like, after we've gone through some of our exercises and after you've done the whole day with Duncan, you will find that there are many things about that book you wrote down today at the start of the day that appear in lots of other books you like. That's because those are more about what is appealing to you about the book. In those categories specifically, the pacing, the characterization, the storyline, the, the frame and the setting, the tone and the mood, the style and the language. This is actually the heart of why you book. Like, we're going to walk through it. And that is the heart of why you like to read it. 
and it's why you might like other titles. Because when you read for the appeal of the book and not for what happens, you, get, you understand more possibilities of other books people might enjoy. Again, every reader reads a different version of the same book. Listen to what patrons tell us about a book they read. You've read the book yourself, listen harder. Don't assume they will describe the book the same way at all. I have a very good example, which I believe is an international title and it's older, The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold. And if you're not familiar with it, um, I'll explain it enough to look at it. And Duncan can pull it up later. But here are actual ways this book has been described to me. This is the same book, Actual Patrons. For some, it's about the rape and murder of a young girl, even though she is dead and marrying from the very first lines of the book. And the description of her rape and murder are over after 20 pages of a 350-page book. For others, um, it's been described to me as a book about a family dealing with a crisis. For still others, it's been described to me as a book about how people mourn. And as a fourth way it's been described to me, someone came up to me after one of these talks once and said to me, um, you know what, Becky, add this to your talk. For me, this book was comforting because Susie was narrating from heaven. It made me think um, that there was something that happened to us. It was comforting that something happens to us after we die. And that's what I enjoyed most about the book. And that's what it was about for me. Those are four very different versions of the same book. When you use appeal terms or these adjectives, you can describe a book a lot more, uh, a lot better. The lovely bones, if we, I'm going to use those words only on your sheet. Now, I'm going to sound crazy. People don't talk this way. I'm going to an extreme. The lovely bones is deliberate, measured, heartbreaking, yet ultimately redeeming, dramatic, introspective, with intriguing and well-developed secondary characters, a first-person narration from heaven, vivid, character-centered, complex family-centered, inspirational, thought-provoking, tragic, some explicit but not gratuitous violence against children, bittersweet, darker, and philosophical. Of course, I am drawing from the adjectives in that controlled language there, and patrons do not walk around. But readers do use a lot of adjectives when they talk to us. And if we train ourselves to listen to them and to ignore the plot that they are giving us, we will learn a lot more from them. So one could imagine a reader coming in and saying, and this is paraphrased from an actual patron, I just finished The Lovely Bones and really enjoyed how the book looked at each family member and how they dealt with their loss and grief differently. So this reader liked the character-centered and family-centered aspects and a lot of the introspective aspects. This re reader would also like the author I call the queen of families with issues, Jodi Pico, and her novels of ordinary families dealing with extraordinary crises. You would not lead the, this reader to people who like um, the investigations of child murder books. In fact, this was a huge problem in the U.S. when the book first it was on the New York Times bestseller. This description basically made it sound like it was the investigation of the rape and murder of a young girl. All of my readers who uh, checked it out based on the fact that it was a New York Times bestseller and all they knew was that sentence, who happened to be mystery readers, did not like this book. It made it sound like an investigative book. And although we, the reader, find out who killed Susie, um, the, the family does not. And that was very troubling to a lot of history readers. So we do have to be careful of how uh, that everyone reads a different version of the same book, apparently. But the point you have to understand through all these examples is that people are looking for a book with a particular feel. They are not looking for a particular thought. Again, think about yourself. Bring it back to you. Look at that book on the top of your page. You are not looking, you liked, you liked that book a lot, enough to write it down. You are not looking for the same plot, but you are looking for a similar feel. And that feel comes from those words in front of you, those adjectives. This, and, and let me give you an even more simple example before we start working with each of you works with your own book. When you read, for example, The Da Vinci Code, 
the first things people think are that, or that they say, is that it's fast paced, that there are puzzles to solve. Exactly. Historically, are not thinking about exactly or talking about exactly what happens in the plot. And before we move on to, I want to mention, this is a good point in keeping with being uh, a good time, keeping with being non-judgmental, all appeal terms must be positive. So it is, so I always like, this is a book I love, but it's it's slow, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. And I use this as an example because it's going to be a movie in this calendar year. Um, and it's not slow paced, it's measured paced. Because no Becky, your sound's completely dropped out for a fast. while. Oh my, oh my gosh. Yeah, it just when you're getting to the measured pace. So if you could just kind of recap about the last minute, that would be great. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was saying that, you know, the goldfinch is measured pace, and you wouldn't, although you think it's slow, you don't call it slow because that's judgmental. Um, it's also when we talk about a book like by James Patterson, it's not written simplistically, it's written unembellished. And so that is what we say in those terms. And you'll see those terms on there. Now, to make this clearer, we're gonna, you're going to take that sheet in front of you with your book. I'm going to go over that sheet in detail. I am not going to read those words to you, and nor are those the only words you should use. But I'm going to ask you some leading questions for you to think about your book. As I go through each area, I would like you to circle the words that um, your book speaks to you for your book. Please add adjectives for your book that you feel very strongly about. So, for example, um, one of my favorite terms, it's two words, but heartbreakingly beautiful. That's not on there, but that's a term I use a lot to describe books that are like, they make you cry, but... And you're sad, but it was beautiful, and you're not like in despair. So whatever works for you. But the fact is um, that I want you to make sure you're writing down adjectives. Now, you might not remember something for every category for your book, especially if it's been a while since you've read it. But that's okay. That means those areas did not leave a lasting impression on you. And therefore, are not important to your version of the book. We're going to talk about how novelists can help you fill in those other areas. We're worried about your version right now. So when you go through, like I said, circle this down. The areas with which you are most excited, where you feel like you're writing the most and circling the most, put a star in that area. That means that area was really important to you. And when we go on to the next exercise, where you're going to have to share your appeal with your neighbor, that's going to be important because that's going to be where you're going to begin. Okay, so let's go to pacing right now. Think about your book. Pacing is one of those things that if you as a reader, any reader, gets the wrong paced book at the wrong time, they're not going to like it. Sometimes pacing doesn't matter, but if you need a fast-paced book and you pick up a slow one, even if at another time it would be great for you, it's just I find that people aren't going to like it. So this is important to know every time I read a book I, um, because I know that later I'm going to have to recall that. Remember I talked about writing down the adjectives. This is a way to get started um, in you thinking about what you're reading and getting those written down. So what is the pattern of the pacing in your book? Are they the characters? think about the pacing. Are there really short sentences, short paragraphs? Okay, short Becky, we just had another really bad glitch. If you could repeat about the last yeah. minute. Oh. Okay, so I'm doing the questions on pacing. What is the pattern of pacing? Are the characters in plot quickly revealed or slowly? Is the book densely written? Are there short sentences, short paragraphs, and short chapters? And does your book have a prologue that introduces the story? was suspense it will it's kind of puts you in the middle of the book and then pulls back and um you know then you go to the beginning but you're reading very quickly to catch up um where you know 
saw this happen in literary fiction. Um, it could have happened before. Was Water for Elephants? Um, that book begins with an elephant about to stomp on someone's head, and then it pulls back to a nursing home, and it takes a while to get to that elephant. But you're reading to get there. Um, so anyway, those are some words for your book's pacing. Now we're going to move on to characterization. Are the characters developed over time? Or are they stereotypes we recognize immediately? If they are stereotypes, it's probably not very important that you have characterization. I just lost the audience, Ellen. Are you still there? Yes, we still live. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, that got scary for a minute. Sorry. <laughs> is the focus of your book on a single character or several whose lives are intertwined? Is the reader expected to identify with the characters or observe them? Now, what is the point of view from which your story is told? Think about that with your book. You might not remember explicitly if it was first person or third person omniscient, but did you see into the characters' minds? Did you know what they were thinking? I now always note point of view in every book I read because I started to realize that my readers really cared about it. They would come back and say things like, it was too many characters, it was too confusing, or I really wish I could get deeper into so-and-so's uh, thoughts, and I didn't get that enough. And if you notice any book I've reviewed in Booklist, and you can see them on Novelist, so I always like Booklist is first alphabetically, so if I reviewed the book, it's there first. Um, but I always now note the point of view, because it's something that people care about that the publisher doesn't note, that it's just hard to tell other places. So I make sure I give that information to uh, librarians. Um, here's another thing that people really care about. Um, maybe I, I can see hands for this. Um, who really likes reading series? Put up your hand if you really like reading a series of books. Awesome. Now, who avoids series like the plague? Are there anybody with hands up for that? Yep, a couple. It's a big dichotomy. And then there are a lot of people in the middle. Some people seek out series, and some people avoid them. But does your book have series characters that are followed through and developed over several novels? That re, um, series helps you speed up book about a character. Some readers really like this. Your series, I always note it because some people won't read it then. Um, I have plenty of patrons who will only get a series or only get not a series. Are there memorable or important secondary characters? The example I always use for this is for, for um, here is the Janet Ivanovich Stephanie Plum Mysteries. Because when I ask, and I'm not going to do it here, but when I ask, I say, who's your favorite character for people who like it? Nine times out of ten, and literally it comes out to almost exactly that, it's not Stephanie Plum, the main character. It's one of the secondary characters, the grandma or her best friend, most notably. Um, next, with your book, is characterization the most important point of the book? Is it about the characters? Is it a character study? Is it what characters are going through more than the action that's happening? And there are many words there that you can choose from, again, and you might want to think of your own, too. And then we'll move on to storyline. What is the author's intention guard to storyline? I'm actually going to, I realized I have this ready to be pulled up, so I'm going to pull it up. So there are the words for storyline. What is the author's intention? Is it about the people, or is it about the situations and events that happen? Is the focus on the other more on what's happening outside, inside the character? Story take place on more than one level. Is it a straight storyline? Is it metaphors? Is it a story within a story? Is there a frame around it that matters? We'll talk specifically about frame and moment. Okay, so this one I want to talk about a little bit more than just that, though, as we look at all those words. There are many, many words. This area is where we see limiters. I know in America people call them trigger warnings. I don't call it that. I call it limiters, something that may make you not want it, and I feel like that opens it up to many more options because you have no idea what's going to limit a story for someone. I had a homebound patron who I would tell um, and we would, you know, get her books for her and send them to her. Someone else would bring them. She asked, could the word cancer not appear in her books? Like, literally, even if it was used not to refer to the disease, but someone was called and referred to as a cancer. 
And I said to her, ma'am, I cannot do that. I cannot preview every book for you to that level of specificity. However, I am doing my best to make sure that cancer is not a major theme or trope or something that's going to come up as a storyline. However, if anything does, and I missed it, close the book, send it back to us, call me. We normally give you 10 books for the month. If that's not enough, we can bring you over more. And, and she just appreciates that I was looking out for her. Um, but limiters can be a lot of different things like sex and violence, which we're going to talk about at the end of this, a way to find um, very frank talk about sex and violence. So you don't have to have those conversations at the desk. Um, but fact is that you might want to mark it if you found your book was steamy or violent. Again, if it's in novelists, it'll be in there too as marked. But I have to say there are some other limiters that don't show up anywhere else that I, I found very common. The one most common one is if an animal dies. There is like the dog dies website that's starting to add books. There's not a lot of books. But I can tell you, I had a patron that happened to me who read and suspense where people were brutally murdered and dismembered where children were killed and put in danger and one time I gave her one book dog dies I think it was actually a kitty cat it was a cat she threw the book at me like across the desk at me she was so angry at me so we never know what's gonna trigger people make sure if an animal dies you mark it one time I reviewed this great Nigerian horror book on my horror blog, and it begins with a brutal murder of a dog. And I wrote in the review, okay, guys, this book opens with a brutal murder of a dog. But that is there so that you understand that the person doing it is super evil. You're not supposed to be happy about it. So make sure that you mark those things in a book that happens either or not. Okay, and tone. I'm going to talk about uh, first. Um, so frame is about the background and the setting and the details. So if your book is a historical fiction, for example, the frame is going to matter. If your book is fantasy, the frame is going to matter. It's all about the world building, right? Where you are in space and the details about that and time matter. Book is historical fiction or Fantasy and you want to put a star um, but also um, what's the fact uh, you know if it's an isolated house deep dark in the woods it's going to be more ominous than if it's set on the beach with a bunch of friends going on vacation although that can quickly turn to a horror story too but um, it, is there a special background is it a the background details matter. The story really somebody who uses a lot of frame is Nora Roberts. All her stories have a great background frame about something else. Um, so you learn something too while you're reading her books. Romance in general has a lot of frame because there's always background detail. Uh, the professions of the Becky, it might be good if you could actually repeat the last minute or so. We're having really patchy sound here. Thanks. I'm so sorry. Okay, so I was just talking about how frame can really be used a lot in romance. Um, really specific um, frame that draws you in. And Nora Roberts does this very well. We have terms there for frame and tone. And let me talk a little bit about tone. But um, frame, like if you are in a specific time and place, you should be marking that. Uh, the tone and the mood also we want to talk about. As I said, does the frame and the setting affect your tone? Um, and does the tone dominate your impression of the book? So if it was a horror book, I bet the tone does. Romance, I bet the tone does. It might not if you were reading a mystery. Although if you're big fan if your book's a cozy mystery and you really like those because they're lighter then that's definitely something that um, where the frame and the tone are affecting each other there are a lot of words to describe tone many more that are on this page um, but think of 
book and the way the, the tone it sets. One of my favorites is, um, and I don't think it's on here, it's not unaffected. I like that to describe books that are not pretentious in any way. Pretentious is judgmental. Unpretentious can also be judgmental, but unaffected is a good term to, to use. And by Does the writing matter? Does um, are they an important part of the story? Is this go back and read over and over? Or is it a book the style is used? Those ones all work hand in hand. Um, I guess unpretentious is there. Um, but anyway, is it poetic? Is it, you know, you know, this is the way it is, declarative. And it's the way the book is written more important than Now, now I'm done talking for a few minutes. Now what we're going to do is you are going to, um, we're going to go in pairs, and in a moment, you're going to have two, and what you are going to do is describe your book to a fellow um, attendee there today. You may give them the title of the book, and if you need to, you can say the genre, although you could probably work it in, um, because if it's a fantasy, you could say it's set in the, his, the, the, the fantiful, fantiful world that doesn't exist of blank. But I'll let you do that. No plot. You may only talk in adjectives to the person that you're working with. Your job when you're is to practice leaving plot behind and focusing on the feel of the book. You will feel like you're giving out important information or leaving out important information. However, I want you, and then everyone is going to get it, we're going to switch. When you are listening, you will see how much you learn about the feel of the book. Who else? Like so much more than if you gave the person two minutes and they spent a minute of it on plot. So what now is you're going to find a neighbor to talk to. I'm going to set a timer. <laughs> I'm going to tell you when the two minutes are up, and then you're going to switch. So everyone gets the chance to be a talker and a listener. Okay? So find a neighbor. Is everyone near someone? Someone next to you? I see someone. Okay. Everybody, do you think we're ready? Okay, start with the first person. Two minutes. About 30 seconds left on the first person.
Okay, you're done with the first person, so let's finish up with the first person. Thank you so much for talking, and I hope the listeners learned a lot about the book. Um, now we're going to switch for two minutes, and the speaker is the listener, the listener, the speaker. Here we go, two this minutes. This is where you switch, because you're so loud, you're not hearing De Becky, so it's obviously going really well, but you need to switch around so that the listener is now the speaker. Thank you. I'm starting the timer. <laughs> One minute left. Okay, Ellen, if you could help me get them to stop. <laughs> the timer's <laughs> up. Okay, I'm just going to try and say, okay, great. Time for the discussion to stop now, then you can hear the microphone again. Obviously, it was a really <laughs> good discussion people were having. <laughs> And that's what always happens, and I'm so glad because when I do this, and I'm, when I'm in the room with people, and this is a talk I do virtually and um, in person, but when I'm in the room, I get these looks of fear. What do you mean I can't talk about the plot? How are you doing this to me? Um, and I feel like by forcing you to just throw the plot away, the plot is going to be there. That plot is on the book. That plot is on Goodreads. That plot is on Novelist. You don't need it. When I started, I had to record plots because it was back in the Stone Ages of the beginning of the 21st century, and it was harder to find a reliable plot. Now, I don't even worry about it anymore. I just use, for better or worse, the publisher's summary of the plot. Now, there are issues with that, but the one thing that there are no issues about, it's standard. Everybody sees that same summary. So if I use that as the starting off point of what everybody knows, I can then add in the appeal, why you'd want to read the book beyond what happens. Because I'll tell you, I don't ever pick my book based on what happens in it unless it's one of those frames that I really love. So I'm originally from the state of New Jersey, and although I live in Illinois now, I very much love to read books set in New Jersey. Um, I just love to, and I'll read anything. So for me, that's a frame that matters. Some plot can be considered frame. But the point is, I, when I do this with everybody, you give me these looks of fear, and then I can't get you to stop. And that's wonderful. Now, normally if I was there, we would do some sharing of what you learned. But just in general, I want you to think, because it's going to be hard in this setting, but I want you to think about how much you learned about the book you heard about and how much you got a sense of the feel of that book, especially if it was a book you were unfamiliar with. Now, now everybody has that experience listening. Oh, you should have understood why the person talked 
do with what happened. Also, now as a speaker, every one of you, you were forced to think about why you liked the book beyond what happened and forced to share that. By the way, you have now done a book talk. Um, when we get to step six, book talk every chance you get, you can't tell me you don't know how to book talk because every single one of you just did it. So I love doing that too because um, I get a lot of fear from people when I really sh talk about book talking. I can't do it. I can't do it. You did. I tricked you, but you did. So that's what's also great about that. The other thing I say is as you go out into the world to share books with readers, this is the book you should start with. Why? You've already practiced doing it. Ellen, I did not speak to you about this, but if you guys have time later in the day, when I'm there for a whole day of training, I often, um, sometime after lunch or when there's a break, I ask people to go and share this book again, the same way you just did now, with somebody completely different, and it would help if you were in a different location. Because being in the same spot, you know, saying, it makes you say the same things. So often when I'm at a training, I'll say later in the day, okay, now I want you to go find someone you don't really know or somebody you didn't share this book with before and go share your book. But instead of doing it two minutes on, two minutes off, I set a timer for five minutes and let you have a conversation where you both share the book. If you can't do that today, this is something you can take back and do at work. You can, with your colleagues, you can say, hey, you know, here's, give them the sheet and sort of go through making them think about the feel of the book. You'll learn a lot of these things, too, from Duncan later on how to do it. And then have them share, and then share with each other. But try to find multiple ways to share the book you just shared. You will see that depending on what the other book is, the other person in the conversation, what you share may be different. I I'm find that to be a very liberating. Did we cut out again? No, I was just going to butt in briefly and oh. suggest that this could be a good way for people to meet new people at lunchtime. Yes. While you're in the That's sandwich exactly. Or in I the actually do that. I actually tell people, depending on how we're doing lunch, sometimes if it's like a cue, right, exactly, I make them talk to the person that they're in line with. But I also sometimes tell um, the administrators to not let people who know each other sit together. I'm not going to be that mean today. But it's a great activity. The more times you talk about this same book, the more experience you get, the less nervous you are. Um, and then you'll have more, you'll be able to move on to other books later. And I'm going to talk about other tips for doing book talks in a moment. But the important point is you're going to lose these adjectives if you don't write them down. The plot you can find everywhere. The adjectives you cannot. So let's remember that, please. Now, the good news is, and Duncan's there, and I know he's fine with this because I say it all the time, and he tells me I can. If you um, don't know what adjectives to write down, take the ones from novelist. Wherever you're writing them down, just mark appeal terms from novelist. As long as you're giving them credit, they don't care. So like on Goodreads sometimes I tell people, I often start my Goodreads review, I cut and paste the novelist things, I make a note which ones are from novelist, and then I go back and sort of add my own words. And if I keep them, I keep in that tag. But anybody can just go into Goodreads, which is connected through novelist, by the way, so it's super easy to get to, and you can just record the appeal terms there and then maybe use that to help kind of write up your own thing. I say at least get down three words that describe the book, the feel, not the plot. And we'll look at that in a minute. Okay. The other thing is you need to read as widely as you can when you do reader's advisory. And I don't mean that you have to read every book that comes out. You don't. Because you can speed read. And you, when you're speed reading for appeal, you don't necessarily need the book in front of you to speed read. Because again, it doesn't matter what happens in the book. We're not worrying about that. We're throwing plot to the side. It is not our concern anymore. The feel of the book is our concern. So when I say we speed read, there are many ways we can speed read for appeal without actually having the book in our hand. Let me give you one example um, that I'm going to tell you and one example I'm going to show you on the screen in just a moment. One of my favorite ways to speed read a book for its appeal is by going to Goodreads and reading the five-star customer reviews and the two-star customer reviews. The five-star people love the book, and they gush and gush about why. And let me tell you, go look for yourself on any book. They don't gush about why they love it because of what happened. 
They gush about it because there's a character, there's a setting, the way it's written. Something about the appeal of the book is why they love it. The people, um, I say two stars because the one star review people, they're just haters. They have nothing good to say about the book. And sometimes the reason they give it one star is not helpful. Two star people care enough to give it that extra star and they will tell you why they did not enjoy it. The three star people not as good at the why they didn't. Two star people will reveal some of those limiters. What was limiting to that reader? Again, it's why I use limiters and not trigger warnings. Because limiters are not just things that make somebody upset. A limiter is something that for that reader means they wouldn't like the book. A great example would be, I one time had a reader, a reason I love Haruki Murakami is because um, the, I, every book has a cat that talks, and I, or you know, it, usually a cat. And I love that the cats speak to the, to the reader, to the protagonist. And I find it so interesting, and I love the way he uses that motif throughout all of his books. One time I was working with a student who I said, you know, it, would, it sounds like you would love Haruki Murakami, the way she described books she likes. She said, oh, yeah, I can't read him. I can't read books where animals talk. Like nothing, like Red Wall, um, Watership Down, like nothing. If an animal talks, it is dead to me. For her, that's a limiter. Again, it's not a trigger warning. It doesn't make her physically ill or upset. It simply is something she does not enjoy in her books. Those kind of things show up in two-star reviews. Um, and those are important because that might be the reason someone doesn't like a book. So we can speed read the record on Goodreads. Another way to speed read um, the book for its appeal on Goodreads is to go over to Goodreads and look at the shelves, the tags people put on a book. That shows you what people think the book is most important to them. And often, sometimes I find things that I like show up very few times and things that other people, other tags about a book show up that I wouldn't even think of. So it's very interesting to look speed read a book for appeal on Goodreads. But also, you can speed read a book for appeal on Novelist. And I think it probably, my session probably timed out, but I pulled up this, the book. So I picked The Orphan Master's Son. It's one of my all-time favorite books. It won the Pulitzer Prize, and it's about North Korea. So it's one of those books that have, people have been giving out a lot recently. It's one of those backlist books that people are reading. And Duncan's going to go over this in a lot more detail, and he knows I'm doing this, but I wanted to show you how much you can tell about the appeal of a book from the novelist record. You can speed read a book from this record. So um, it gives you a very simple uh, plot synopsis, and it's usually very simple. It's from another source. They don't do those on their own. But the appeal terms are right there. In this case, we get genre. And for novelists, they think about genre a lot more broadly than we normally do, which I like, and, and Duncan will speak to you about those categories. But the storyline is unconventional. It's told in a very unconventional way. Um, and I think that that's very important to note. In fact, it's like um, I actually did it as an audiobook because it was the main character telling you sort of his life story, and he's very unreliable, but I liked it as an audiobook. The tone, it's bittersweet, disturbing, romantic, and violent. I picked this book for this reason. Those tone terms seem counterintuitive, but they're not. This book, but what I would say to you is, as a reader, maybe your version is bittersweet and violent, um, but maybe it's not all these terms. But novelist is the way we're seeing it for many readers, all the possible readers. Um, and I actually love when they use romantic, because there is a time in that book if you haven't read it, I would read it just for this. When the character goes to America for just a moment, and he describes freedom from the perspective of someone who didn't do the word but had never experienced it, it is a scene I will never forget in a book. And it's very romantic in terms of the, the not romance, but the, the actual definition of the word in that it, it's just reminds you of what it means to be free and, and what it means if you finally understand what freedom is. And it's, it's really well done. Okay, so the, that's the literal appeal, speed reading for appeal. But then you always have reviews. And I do know with Australian titles, there'll be Australian review journals too. But 
in the reviews, you get a lot of appeal. I'm not going to read them all for you today. You can go look at them up yourself um, in the interest of time. But I wanted to just make sure that you understand that the reviews are written, especially book list and library journal, are written with appeal in mind. They, the editors, and I write for both, the editors clearly want the, the reviewers to articulate appeal. You can also find, and it won't work now because I've timed out, but for audiobooks and any lists or articles the book appears in, in this case for this book there are other articles that the title appears in about different types of books. Um, and it gives you more, it leads you to more, and, and Duncan can show you how all this works later. But just by spending 10 minutes really digging into a record, oh, and also checking the read-alikes on the side, which I think, yeah, it timed out, but if you, if you hover over them it gives you the why. They were matched, and in there, those why statements, and I've written some of those too, are based on appeal, not based on what happens. In this case, some of them are based on the setting, because setting is an appeal, obviously. So, North Korea will come back later in my talk. Okay, let me get down. We have about 30 minutes left, so let me get down to um, the rest of it. Now, I purposely take about an hour to do those first five um five topics because they're so important and vital. They're so different from the way you probably thought before you came in. I just want to make sure those are clear. Now, number six is re share what you read with everyone. And I talk about, I have an entire presentation for book talking every chance you get. I have purposely, that if you click on that link in your free time, I'm going to give you a quick summary, but that goes to anything I've tagged book talk on my blog, including when I give a presentation on book talking. Quite often I come to libraries and do this RA for all and then book talking right after it as an entire morning session. And when we do that, um, I, but I make those slides very text heavy that you can actually use them to learn how to book talk, even you. So please click through and see that. And also it'll bring up the most current one always because I make changes all the time. It also links to ways you can practice book talking, which I'm going to talk about now too. And I have a link here, a step-by-step -step guide on how to go back to your library and make book talking a friendly competition and get everybody involved no matter where they work in the building and get every single person out in front of patrons at some point during the day talking about a book um, to start those conversations. And again, in, the, in there, it's fully described, and there's actually a link to the presentation there, how you can do that with your staff. But when I say book talk every chance you get, I truly believe that a library which encourages every single person on staff to talk about the things they are doing in their free time, things that can be checked out of the library, books, movies, music, TV shows, anything, audiobooks, to encourage staff to talk to each other about the books, I'm using books again to, for all those things, that they're reading at the desk to each other is so vital to the library's success. It's vital to your staff because it gives them a chance to practice. Remember, every time you talk, someone's listening. If you let someone else talk, you're listening. You're practicing both skills. I encourage libraries to let people wander the building when they can and go find someone they don't know and share a book. Start with the book you shared today. Share anything you're reading, but focus on the appeal. Don't talk about what's happening. When you do this, you practice your skills. You show that you um, that this is important. You advertise to everyone who walks into the building that this is a place where conversation happens. This is a place where, patro where the staff care about sharing what they read. A lot of times people think that they shouldn't ask you, that they shouldn't bother you with their leisure needs, with their wants. But they should, and we need to let them know. And the best way we can let them know is by demonstrating that we care about them for ourselves, that we talk to each other. Often I then would um, talk to patrons and I would say, okay, sometimes I would give a patron a book and say, I don't have time to read this, I think you'd like it, come back and book talk it for me. I trained so many of my customers to come back and share the books that they were bringing back because I made it clear that I wanted to know and that I was sharing, that we started having conversations at the desk. I would have people interrupt us to then be part of the conversation. That's what we're trying to do. Again, the step-by-step -step guide will help you. But we need to encourage everyone to do it. 
I have so many stories of people who didn't work in traditional public service who'd start at book talking after I trained. I'm going to share just one with you it's from a library in Indiana. It's a three library system. When I went to go there to do their full day in service, the um, director said to me, Becky, I don't think we should have our maintenance staff come. I know you said they should. I said, you need to have the maintenance staff come. Please just trust me. Their um, oldest janitor, their oldest custodian, um, who'd been there forever, came to every single one of my talks. The first two everyone went to, and then there were other things, and he kept following me throughout the day. There were some breakout sessions for more specific things. And he came to all my sessions. And apparently, I heard back a few months later when she called me, she said, Becky, thank you so much for insisting that everyone come. That custodian, I, I'm going to call him George, George loved your talks. He took it upon himself to start telling everybody about what he's reading. He started by talking to the staff like you encouraged him. He'd, he'd take breaks from cleaning or working on something or setting up a room or whatever it was to talk to the staff. He eventually got up the courage to talk to patrons. He now wanders all three buildings finding people, staff or customers, to talk to about what he's reading. He's older and reads different books than a lot of our female and younger staff read. He's been encountering patrons who didn't really engage with us before. People ask for him when they haven't seen him. And she said to me, the kicker, the library's never been cleaner. This is something <laughs> that can get, I swear, this is something that can reinvigorate staff. This is something that can make them feel part of that core business, that reading. It can make every single person on staff feel valuable to what you are doing as an institution. Gives them a place. I had my technical services person take breaks to come down and talk to staff. And her job satisfaction went up. Her um, her interaction with the, with the rest of the staff, because they were not very fond of her before this, her um, her production went up everything because we let her get away from her desk and go talk to people so just book talk every chance you get you will create lifelong um you will create lifelong users of the library even if they just see you once the last story i'm going to share about book talking before i move on to the final steps is that we created a library when i was at berwin that so many of us talked we would literally stop and be like five minute book talk gather around like in the middle of the library and we do it to each other that we would have so many people talking about books all the time. Now, my desk was not in the quiet area. I need to say this. Um, but we were right near the front door. We actually moved my desk, uh, my department's desk, to the front door to encourage conversation so that we could talk to everyone who walked in, so everyone could hear us talking. But one day, a man walked in and shushed me. And I said, oh, my goodness, sir. Hold on. Do you need the qu quiet area of the library? I can, I can tell you where that is. It's downstairs. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to get in trouble. And I said, oh, thank you so much, sir. But number one, I am the supervisor here. And number two, this is a floor where, um, this is a part of the library where we talk about what we're reading, what we're watching, anything that we're doing that can be checked out of the library. We share it here, and we'd love for you to share yours, too. And it's not a quiet area, so it's okay. And literally on cue, we, we used to share the floor with children's. These story time kids came out, and at the end of our story times, they would do a parade with percussion instruments. And I swear I did not plan this, but they came out, and they were banging on the drums. And he just started laughing, because clearly shushing was not necessary. But I did. He then joined in. He's like, oh, well, I just checked out this, or I'm going to come in to get this movie. or, And, and we brought him into the fray. <coughs> Excuse me. We made him part of the conversation that we were having. So don't underestimate how important it is to share. But again, as the example setters, as the leaders, try to share the feel of the book, not the plot. Okay, moving on. Number seven, you need to use resources. This is where North Korea comes up again. Um, you need to think of your job as leisure reading reference. Because when you just say reader's advisory, you lose track of what it is. When people ask me what I do, I say, Hmm, what, what is it the term that people know? Well, reference. So I do reference for the things you want to do for fun, like movies, books, um, DVDs, or TV shows. And they say, oh, I get that. Okay, so you help me with my, with what, I say I help you with what you want, not what you need. But we need to remember, that there's a problem with that. 
when we think of ourselves as helping readers, we think we have to act differently than we do as librarians. Now let me go back. You know, as a librarian, if someone came in and asked you, hey, North Korea's in the news, what do you know about North Korea? You're not going to say to them, off the top of your head, everything you know about North Korea. Of course not. You're going to use the resources. What do you want to know? Do you want newspaper articles? Do you want, you know, uh, geographic information, census data? You're never going to tell them off the top of your head. You wouldn't do that. Okay, how come when someone comes in and says, I just read The Orphan Master's Son and really loved all the stuff that had to do with North Korea and the unreliable narrator, do you think that immediately librarians think, oh no, I haven't read that book. I can't help this person. And they freeze up. Of course you can help this person. They do not expect you to know off the top of your head. You know why they don't expect you to know? Because we've trained them for like 150 years that librarians find the answers. We don't know them. They don't expect us to do that. Why do we expect it of ourselves? You can use the resources. I'm going to give you resources down below. One of this is no them is novelist. Duncan will talk to you about how to use it. You don't have to have read the book. Now, you can't lie and said you've read it. But you can clearly say to them, well, here's what the resources say. Here's what readers, actual readers on Goodreads who liked it and didn't like it say. That's great. That's just as good as you saying how you feel, feel about it. Because at least on Goodreads, you have so many different versions of the same book. Let's see what they had to say. Make it, a, it's, it's not a here's my question, here's my answer. Just like you wouldn't just start handing files of papers to the person who asked the North Korea question. You'd want to know what they wanted to know specifically about the country. You wouldn't necessarily just start handing them stuff. Same thing with leisure reading. You wouldn't simply start handing them answers. It's a process. You can work together and look at the resources together. So when I think of my job, when I add the word reference to the job, leisure reading reference, it triggers in library workers to use resources. Speaking of, your best resource is working together. Um, remember when I said on number four, write down adjectives about what you read? Um, one of the best ways to write down the adjectives about what you read is somewhere where everybody else can see them. I always highly recommend Goodreads. Um, you can then link together as a library, and you can put down your adjectives, your appeal, your version of the book on your shelf, and your staff, fellow staff members can um, find them. There are many ways to do it. You can make yourself a library on Goodreads, and then you can link to the shelves of your workers. Um, a lot of libraries also do on their contact page, on their website. You can have, um, under each person's name, see what Becky is reading, see what Duncan is reading, see what Ellen is reading, and it clicks to their Goodreads page. What's great about this is if you know that somebody reads a lot of science fiction, you can go to their page. You don't, and someone's asking you a science fiction question, they could be on vacation. They could work a different shift. They could be in a different building. But you can still see what they've been reading and what they have to say about it. So um, it's important to work together as much as possible. Find ways to share with each other as much as you can. Because one person reading five books is great, but if you have a library of 20 people and each of them read five to 20 books each, that's a lot of books. That compound interest builds fast. You get access and you do it for another year and you get another couple hundred books and you just keep going. There's plenty of books and reviews for everyone. And you don't have to read every book. You have a personal connection in the library with everything. Number nine talks about bridging the physical virtual divide. It goes to, again, um, a link of every time I talk about that. But the short version is find ways to create this conversation place that you have in the library. Find ways to create that online. I always say, like I said, start at Goodreads. I hear a lot from libraries, you know, we try to do discussions on Facebook. We try to do that. But you know what? Your patrons don't go to Facebook to talk about books. You know where they go to talk about books? Goodreads or whatever resource you guys use. That's where they go. Go to a book place to talk about books because um, that's where they are. But you can find ways to share things. If you are good at book talking, you can record yourself and put it on your website. You can. There's lots of examples there. If you make a display, you should take pictures of it and put it on Instagram. Don't lose things. Don't lose your wonderful in-building stuff. 
conversely, don't only do things online. If you do have a great bookstagram where you're doing these book covers and little things about the books, which is great, by the way. If you post a picture of a book, like someone holding a book, and if they and uh, Skokie Public Library here in Chicagoland does it really well. And if they take each staff member, and this is a great trick, by the way. So um, they don't do this, but do it this way. If you have an in-service day and everybody's there already, and let's say, just for example, you have 52 staff members, if every single person brings one of their all-time favorite books once a year to the staff day, and at some point during the staff day, you line them up and you get a picture of them holding their favorite book, they can cover their face. They don't want their face shown. Every other book, and they give you a piece of paper with words. You have 52 books a week for a whole year done on your one staff day. And all you did was did maybe, you know, a half hour of work of taking the pictures. And then that one person does have to load those all and set them to post. But you can keep a file and just do it once a week or whatever you want to do. That's a great use of it. That's what you do. And then you also have those books for future to remember that so-and-so likes this book. And you can put it on staff picks displays. It's just a wonderful way, again, to get everyone involved and bridge the physical virtual divide. For our final 15 minutes, I want to talk about practicing, and I want to talk about resources that you can't live without. And then I'll leave time for questions. Um, Ellen, can you remind me if everybody got the reader profile exercise? Uh, yes, I did. Awesome. That's what I thought. I did check, and I, I made sure, but I wanted to double check. Okay, we're going to talk about the first two. By the way, like I said, this page is always on my blog, and these all link to bigger explanations for these. So the Get Booked podcast is by Book Riot. It's a media company here in America that focuses on books. And that is the Get Booked podcast is a, a virtual recommended reading thing. They're basically doing reader's advisory. That um, link goes to one of the first times, and full disclosure, I was a guest at that point, so that goes to, it links to episode three where I was a guest. In the meantime, they've now gotten a permanent guest host, so they don't have guests on hardly at all anymore. Um, but you can download it and listen. What I love for it as a practice tool is they get people to write in, here's, the, here's what I like to read, here's what I'm in the mood for, here's things, you know, to think about as you're recommending books to me. And then they each give one suggestion. Um, just listening to it is great practice. You listen to a, a reader, you hear the version, their version of what they like, and you get two completely different suggestions based on that. And they go out of their way to not suggest similar things. The next part about it that's so important is that you can also pause it and come up with your own if you want to. Look on Novelist, look on Goodreads, come up with a few and then see what they say. They love, they actually have a lot of librarians who write in giving other suggestions and then in future um, episodes they'll mention those. Um, so and so a librarian or a bookseller, it's really fun. To, um, I've heard my friends book suggestions mentioned there. Um, so that's great. Um, so you do that, and then that you also hear about a lot of different books. The way they book talk the books is great, and so you're learning about a lot of different books. There's many, many ways you can practice by just listening to it. You could participate in Ask a Librarian on um, Twitter. I believe the time is pretty cruddy for you guys when we do it in America, so you'll probably be asleep, but that's okay. You can still participate as a lurker after the fact or reply to people later. You use the hashtag Ask a Librarian. It happens every Thursday. Um, for the Eastern Time Zone of America, it's noon to 1, and it's run by Library Journal, Penguin Random House, and a few other people. And basically, people can write in with their reading requests, and then a bunch of us who are on, I try to be on if I can, give back reading suggestions. Novelist is often on there giving suggestions, too. Lots of libraries do it. But you don't have to do it live to participate. You can just click on the hashtag. Again, there's directions in there in that post. And even if you're not on Twitter, and follow the hashtag and see what people are suggesting. Again, it gives you an example, though, of many different requests. Often we get in these ruts where we hear the same questions over and over, and I'm always shocked at the range of questions that come through on Ask a Librarian. There are so many more things that I never get asked about at my desk that I get asked about on Ask a Librarian, so it keeps my skills fresh. And you also get to see the range of answers you get, and you can reply 
um, I later because I, you know, saw now and I was like, oh, I have the perfect book for them. So that's so great. About it will be in front of you. And if you want to bring it back to with your staff, that link goes to a handout for it. Ellen also has as the PDF. But basically, what is a you, Becky, what um, you like to read and, and, and why? Could you kind yeah. of repeat the last minute? It's been kind of fairly patchy for then. Thanks. Oh, okay. Anyway, so about the reader profile, I talked about participating in Ask Library on Twitter. I'm not going to repeat a lot of it because I said the same thing a few times. Um, but the staff reader profile, you have that in front of you. You can take it out, um, take it back to your staff to work with. Ellen has a link for more to get more copies, and it's on that link on the screen. Um, it asks you to really drill down a little bit more what you like to read and why. So on the front, it says write about three books you like and why. On the back, three books you don't like and why. Or, uh, sorry, on the front. On the back, it asks you to circle your top reading areas. Yes, I know young adult is not a genre. It's reading areas. Um, formats you like reading, any books you enjoy the least, and what your favorite resources are to find books. Why is this important? Number one, it makes you get to the heart of why you like to read the books you do. You cannot help other people find a book to read for fun if you don't know why you read the books you read. Number two, this is an exercise where you can trade these with your fellow staff members. So everybody gets a chance to, um, one, drill down their own reading, and then suggest. You get to get suggested to and get to be the suggester, which is so much fun. So you can share this with everybody on staff, and everybody can trade, preferably with someone you don't know very well, so that you get you use it also as a team building and as a chance for people to get to know each other. And then the other thing is, and this is sort of a little bit evil, but only a little bit evil, whoever is the administrator collecting all these from staff should make a photocopy of them and keep them on file and um, aggregate the data and see what the strengths and weaknesses are among your staff. So, for example, if you find that, like, everybody, uh, nobody put down science fiction as one of their favorite genres, but you know you have, like, 20% of your patrons check out science fiction, you realize that you have to work on that because they're getting to it despite the fact that your staff know nothing about it. It's also a great way to identify if there's that one person who likes science fiction, encourage them to help train the staff, um, to help get information out. Maybe they're a page or a shelver and they don't feel confident sharing with everybody, but they can share with you and you can disseminate that information. It's yet another way for people to get involved with the library. So that is the reader profile exercise. I usually suggest you give people um, two weeks to fill it out, then you switch them, and you give people three weeks to get back to someone. Um, tell them to start with the person's, that final question, where they go for their reading suggestions, to start with that resource. From there, they can ask each other questions. Everybody can help each other. And then I say get back to that person with three suggested things to read. Um, and then ask them, and then you also obviously would get back three, and then give everybody about a month to either speed read or read one of them and just get back via email in a conversation about how they did. So everyone is getting to get to understand their own reader profile, suggest to someone, everyone is getting suggestions, and everyone is part of the feedback loop. It's really a wonderful exercise to do all components of the reader's advisory conversation. And now for the last few minutes, I want to talk about some resources you can't live without. I don't have to talk about Goodreads because I've already talked about it at length. The plot is there. The customer reviews. Please, it's a wonderful resource. Use it. Talked about Novelist, and you can use that yourself. I really like for American series, the Kent District Public Library, because they, even though Novelist has the series, and they're very easy to see, they don't print out as well as Kent District Library. Um, I don't know how familiar you are in... Um, Australia with this, but for example, I'm just going to show you now Nora Roberts because I love this example, I'm trying to get it bigger for you. So we just search Nora Roberts. Look at all these series. Oh my goodness. What's great is somebody just likes that series or that series or that series. You can do a printer-friendly list of just those series. 
series. It's absolutely wonderful. It's a great way to um, help readers, and it's really cheap if you want to print them. Oops, you don't need to see your own thing. Um, okay, let me go back. I didn't realize that that one was not a new tab. Okay, um, but here are the last two I want to talk about before I leave questions, and allreaders.com I already have pulled up. Allreaders.com is an extremely messy site, but nobody talks about sex and violence more frankly than this website. Again, I cannot stress enough how messy this site is. I have already pulled up, let's see, I might have to reset, resend because I pulled it up before we started talking. Okay, see what I mean? It's very messy. Okay, I looked up Kiss the Girls by James Patterson. You can look it up on this site. Um, I'm going to go to the bottom. It's really messy. I'm making you nauseous. I'm so sorry. Um, I use Kiss the Girls by James Patterson because people, I often get patrons who say to me, oh, I don't like violence in my stories. Well, who's your favorite author? James Patterson. That person is a liar. I'm going to turn on my light, by the way. I just realized, I think I can reach. Hold on. The skylight above me, it's getting dark here in America, and so my room is getting dark. Okay. Anyway, um, they're liars. He's only gotten more sexually explicit and more violent since he started. Kiss the Girls is one of his earliest books. Um, let's go down to the bottom. This is what you want to do, the chapter analysis. At the very bottom is writing style. I'm going to make this bigger again. Um, you know, it tells you straight out how violence is. Very gory references to death, dead bodies, and torture. Is there explicit sex? Yes. What kind of sex? It's right there on the screen. There's bestiality. There's rape. This is, you know, there's a lot. It's telling you how honest it is. Um, there's for, an unusual form of death is actually rough sex. So I think that's something you might not be wanting to talk about on the service desk with people. But it is something you need to know. If someone says, oh, my favorite James Patterson book is Kiss the Girls, but I don't really like sex and violence, and you look it up, you know that they just don't want to admit that they like sex and violence. <laughs> and they're really okay with plenty. So this is a really good way to do that. Now, I know novelists will say if something is ex explicitly violent, and they'll say the different levels of, um, of heat index, they do a good job with that. But this is a really, um, look up, go in your free time, Go from my blog and click on it and look up Fifty Shades of Grey. Look up a couple things and see. It's a really good way to not have the conversation, but get the information. And then finally, before I open it up to questions, good nooks. When I am desperate, I distract people. Now, I'm going to click on this. Use my link to use this resource. If you go to their website, they used to let you go to the literature map right away. They do not anymore, which is really frustrating. Um, it's an aqua browser. I did Stephen King. I do Stephen King because he's a best-selling author who everyone reads. Even people who don't like horror like Stephen King. And you can clearly see that. This is like the Pandora for books. Um, and that's why when you go to the site justcanooks.com yourself, they make you start entering the authors you like and don't like to add to their data. You can do that if you want. But often I just want to pull this up. Now, if you want to do a different person, click here where it says literature map, and that's how you can get. I found a way to bypass the system. I swear they changed it because I sent too many people there. And so what I did now, I have to honest, keep checking the links and make sure they haven't bypassed it again, but they're fine. So here's Stephen King. The closer someone is to him, the um, more people have put in those words. I love that, and I can't see it here, but Jane Austen and William Shakespeare show up always. Because everybody reads Jane Austen, and everybody reads Stephen King, and everyone reads William Shakespeare. And if it asks you in the aggregating the data, like, do you like Shakespeare, you wouldn't be like, no. You'd be, or you might. But a lot of people would be like, yeah, sure, he's good. So um, you can then click on somebody else. One of my favorite reader likes for Stephen King is actually George R. R. Martin. He works for a lot of readers. Um, and so then you can center George R. R. Martin and see where he goes. This is a great place to go if you've never heard of the author or if it's you like at all the options and you don't have a way to like think of anything else um, it also like I said distracts them and they might be like oh my gosh I also really like Haruki Murakami um, and you'll be like great that's a whole other avenue we can go to now let's stop talking about Stephen King um, who I love but you know you pick on those we love so that is the end of what I have to say. I'm willing to take any questions right now. Again, all the links are there for you to go back to at any time. And if you click on my logo at any time, you can contact me. So thank you for your time. I will take questions.
cannot hear anything if Ellen is talking. No, I was just trying to encourage okay. people to come to the front to ask their questions, and everyone is either shy or shell shocked. <laughs> and I'm not really picking which from the body language. Um, it is a lot of information, I know, I know. Um, I will say that Duncan and I talked recently, so, you know, and we have similar opinions. So if you have something that you have a question, you can ask him, um, and he'll give you a very similar answer to me, probably. But also, please email me. I, again, you just click on this link, and it has all my contact information embedded in a photo, so I don't get trolled. And I'm on Twitter at ra for all I, my email. I would love and take any questions. So seriously, no questions? Stop sharing. Ooh, now I can see everybody. That's okay. I'm fine with that. It's a lot of information. I think they'll have more after Duncan okay, there goes. There is one question. Um, it would help if you came up to the front, but I will translate okay. it. But, uh, like, I'll relay it. But anyone else with a question, please come up to the front. Um, it was, what do you do with an impatient person who really doesn't want to wait for a reader's yep. advisory uh, discussion? That's it. Yep. Yes, that's a wonderful question. I get that all of the time. Thank you for asking it. Um, for that, I like to keep a list of sure bets at my desk. And this is where having um, this all staff involved really helps. So if you get your staff to put their books on Goodreads, or you do that thing I mentioned with the books, you know, everyone take a picture of everybody with their favorite book at staff day, that is a list of books that work for everyone on staff. And your staff is a microcosm of your community, right? So often I use those as sure bets. That's also where um, staff recommendation shelves really, shelves really help. Um, I tell people everyone can do a staff recommendation shelf if people do Goodreads. I tell my staff if you give it five stars, that means I can put it on staff recommendation shelf. Um, and so that's a good place to send people. The other thing, we always had a book discussion collection. We had a whole bunch of paperbacks and spinners um, by our desk. And those were books that worked really well for our book discussion groups. And because our book discussion groups um, were different, were, we used the same book for two different groups that had different demographics. If they worked for both groups, we kind of called them a sure bet. So we kept those. And if someone was in a hurry, we could run there and just quickly like say, here are three books that worked really well for book club. This one is this. This one is this. This one is this. We had little quick sound bites we could say about them. Um, and hand them out quickly, and that worked really well for us. Oh, one more thing, impatient uh, people. The library reads list here in America we use, but I don't know if that will work for you because the books might not be out. But um, the other thing I use is um, award winners. So whatever your most popular awards are, I use award winners from like three years ago. So because then they'll be on the shelf, and I keep that list handy. Any other questions? Oops, so I think coming. that's it, Becky. We don't have any other questions. Thank you so okay, much uh, for speaking to us today. Oh that was so nice. Now we're going to talk about Sorry? what we did. I got interrupted there. A man. Great. Um, well, have a great no, time with the rest of your day. My next person is going to be a Bye. Oh, very good. Bye. Okay, great. Thank you, Roger. Oh, uh, some of you might need to step out for a minute. Um, this would be the time to do that. But otherwise, what we'd like for us all to do is to talk to the person next to you about something that you'd like to try at work and something that you'd like to try in the next week. So something that you got from that talk that you are definitely going to try in your life. So we're going to be coming back at quarter past 11, so if you do need to step out for a minute, this is the time to do it. And you'll definitely want to stand up 